So the the first one we are going to talk is question number eight. Okay, question number eight. So basically, first you may need to know this complex has a certain color because this is you know a very classical or typical AP experiments. We use the cobalt chloride to react with HCl to produce a complex. So let me show you the four net ionic equation. So basically you can say is the cobalt aqueous plus the chloride and produce the complex. Uh, that's it. Right? So these two ions have different color. So this is something you are supposed to know. So this color is pink. This color is blue. So this is why this part is always hard to prepare because it's built on your observation, your accumulation in AP CAN, especially experiments. So if you know this one is blue, so I will not focus on you know the reaction here today. Okay, you guys you know definitely are uh, uh, feel free you know to watch the YouTube video to get more you know uh, visualization about you know the reaction, the color change, and how the equilibrium will be shifted by you know different you know factors including the concentration the temperature and other stuff right so here we not just focus on this one is blue blue means does it means you know it will absorb the blue light no it does not absorb the blue light actually it absorb the complementary color of the blue light so this is why we see the blue color right does this make sense to you? So if something is blue, there are two possible reasons. The first one, the, the complementary color is absorbed, and then the blue color is left. The second possible reason is it transmits or it emits the blue color, the blue light. Right? So here, obviously, it's based on absorption. So the com complementary color of blue is absorbed. So obviously, we can eliminate this one. right? But Green and red, do we know which one is the complementary color of blue? You might need to recall the, the rainbow, the seven colors in the rainbow, which start from red, orange, yellow, green. What's next? Blue? So basically, we have something called color wheel. So if we simply Divide the color into six, the white color. So let's say we start from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, or violet. And then what does it mean? So which means the complementary color of red is green. So now I say if the red light is absorbed, and then the solution will show a green color. So here we want to see the blue color, which means the orange one is absorbed, is absorbed, right? Uh, but this is not a very, you know, restrict rule. So obviously here, we do not have a orange color, right? But the red one is very close to the orange. So this is why we should choose the red one. Does this make sense to you? Let me know if you have any, you know, further question. So, you, I don't think you need to kind of, you know, really know the color wheel. But at least you know, blue and green are neighboring colors, right? They are close to each other in the spectrum. So definitely it's not green. So this is why you should choose red. But if you have the background in, in fine art, and uh, let's say you mix the different dyes or different, you know, food colors before, you know, oh, red and blue, they have this kind of complementary so, uh, relation that would be you know even better how, how do you think the, the style and the, the pace let me know if you think it's good give me a thumbs up and then we can continue thank you thanks for your feedback so the next one let me see is number seven uh, <laughs> which ion gives a green flame test uh, I'm sorry to tell you for flame uh, for flame test that is something you need to memorize so there's no really a very good explanation for you, but there are some common you know, elements or metals 
you really need to memorize their flame flame color. For example, potassium is purple. But I, I don't think I don't think we need to put too much time here. You guys can definitely find it by yourself. Uh, calcium is a little bit reddish, and strontium, um, I I remember is also reddish. But I'm not one hundred percent sure. You guys can check it. Uh, Barium is is green. It's kind of yellowish green, right? So feel free in your search in Google and get a format. Okay. So there's nothing we can really you know talk too much. So every year, maybe you know, pretty much every year, the flame test is assessed. So take some time. The night before is the test. <laughs> that should be good enough. Because if you you know you prepare right now, you probably forget. <laughs> and it's supposed to be built on accumulation. So which means you really did the, this experiment and you observe the color. But I, personally, I don't like this kind of questions. <laughs> this is not my favorite. Okay, uh, let me see. Then let's go to category number three. Uh, obviously, five, all of you choose question number 13. So let's have a look at question number 13. Uh, this question is very confusing. Uh, so which liquid has highest vapor pressure? Obviously, we know highest vapor pressure with means the smallest IMF, right? The intermolecular forces. So I think the best way is to do a elimination. So first you eliminate the most impossible one, right? So if you compare the A, B, C, D here, there are two factors for you to compare the IMF. The first one is the molecular weight. Basically is how many electrons are in the molecule. Because if the molecular weight is larger, it, the molecule is more polarizable and then it's more likely to have a l larger London dispersion forces. Does this make sense to you? Because the London dispersion forces is based on the instantaneous dipole and the instantaneous dipole is proportional to the number of electrons. So this is the first one, the LDF, London dispersion forces, which is proportional to the molecular weight. The second, you know, factor you can you can think about is the polarity of the molecule, so which is the dipole dipole interaction. So let me make it slightly easy, dipole dipole, right? But sometimes it's really hard to to compare. For example, A and C. C has a large molar mass, but is non-polar. A is slightly polar, but a lower molar mass. So this is always confusing. Right? This is always confusing. So I I probably will not choose B because this one the polarity is pretty small. Why? Think about it's like this. So the dipole moment actually is canceling with, with each other, right? The three chlorines in the bottom will make an overall dipole moment in this way, and the fluorine will make it in this way. So I will not choose B because first, the molar mass is not the largest and is also non-polar, pretty much non-polar. So compared to C, I will prefer C. And then D has the largest, you know, molar mass, uh, but the the polarity is also relatively limited. So I will choose in between C and D. But to be honest, if without checking, I'm not what. 100% sure which one is the correct answer. Uh, I, I did this test, you know, several months ago. I already forgot what it answered. Is D the answer? A B is the answer? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 you are right. I made a mistake. It's the highest vapor pressure means the smallest IMF. So B is exactly the one which is nonpolar with the smallest, you know, LDF. So this should be the answer. I, I I was trying to think about which one has the lowest vapor pressure, or actually I'm thinking about which one has the highest intermolecular forces. So we should choose just the opposite. I apologize. So, so I think now I think it's relatively easier. So B is kind of nonpolar, and then the molar mass is pretty much the smallest. But to be honest with you, 
no one is 100% sure about questions like this. But unfortunately, we will have one, two, three questions like this every year. So this is not really a good type of question. Uh, did I make it clear? Although it's, it's not that kind of, you know, uh, sure. But it, it is the, the, the basic logic clear, guys? Okay, great. Uh, the next one is question number 14. Uh, number 14, uh, I, I like this question. It's pretty interesting. So I think since you know one third of the cyclohexane is liquid and two thirds uh, is vapor. So now suppose you have small three mole of the cyclohexane, and then one mole is in liquid, two mole is in gas, and now suppose the initial volume is one liter. Okay. So which means the pressure, initial pressure, should be proportional to 2 mole of gas divided by 1 liter of volume. Now this makes sense to you? Based on PV nRT, right? So PV equals to nRT, P equals to N over V times RT. So at the same temperature, obviously you can say the pressure is proportional to the mole of gas over the volume, right? So this is the initial pressure. And then we made some change. What is the change? The volume of the container is double. So now the new volume is two liter now. Think about what will happen after you know the container is expanded. In order to keep the same vapor pressure, because we know the vapor pressure should be a constant for a certain liquid at the same temperature. Because if you think about liquid A changing to gas A, this is a reversible process. The K of this process equals to K equals to P A gas over one. Because A is a liquid, so this is one, right? We suppose is a constant. So which means the vapor pressure of A is supposed to be a constant at a certain temperature for a certain liquid. So we are expecting after the expansion, we should have four mole of gas in order to keep the same vapor pressure, right? Does this make sense to you? Because the volume is double, so you need to have a two times amount of the gas molecules. But we only have one mole of liquid, so which means all of the liquid will vaporize, change into gas. So the final mole of gas will be three. So you have three mole of gas, but you have two liter as the volume. So this is the new pressure. The pressure final will be proportional to this one. So if you compare two mole per liter and 1.5 mole per liter, so this is why there is a 25% of increment uh, of decreasement. Okay. So I think for question like this, uh, it will be easier for you just to make some assumptions. Make it easy. So do not you know assume there is only one more gas because you don't like the fractions one third, two third, right? Make it easy. So you suppose there are three moles, and then you can easily say one mole, two mole. And for the volume, one liter is a good number, right? Okay. Uh, and then let's move to category number eight, which is atomic structure and periodicity. Question number 44. Uh, this question is also pretty tricky. So the first three ionization energy for four metallic elements are listed here. Which one will make a chloride salt with the largest lattice energy? So I think first the lattice energy uh, 
what is the symbol for us to express the lattice energy? I forgot. Now just say LE, okay? Lattice energy. So the lattice energy is proportional to the charge of the cation multiplied by the charge of the anion divided by the distance of the two adjacent cation and anion. So this is based on Coulomb's law. You probably are curious about, in Coulomb's law, there's supposed to be a square here, right? If you learn physics. But why there's no in a square? Because the energy is the force multiplied by the distance. So basically the r square and then times another r. So one of the r is cancelled. So this is the basic idea. So here I think the q minus is the same because it is chloride. So we are supposed to find a cation which has a high charge and at the same time it has a small size, right? So how can we find, you know, the charge of the cation based on the first three ionization energies? First, I think we can figure out how many valence electrons are there by, you know, reading where is the significant change, right? Because if there is a significant change, which means that is already the removal of the inner electrons. Uh, let's take this one for example, because this is the you know, most straightforward one. So as you can see, there is a huge increase in between the first ionization energy and the second ionization energy, right? So which means C is supposed to have only one valence electron. And the second one is already the inner electron. Now say some element like sodium. For the sodium is 3s1. So the 3s1 is easy to be removed. And then the second one will be 2p6, which is in the inner shell, which is much harder. So this is why there is a huge increase. So I think we can eliminate C because it's plus one, right? Probably, but we can, you know, have a further look. Uh, the first one, I think it also has only one valence electron. So probably this one can also be eliminated because the significant increase is also here. And then for B, the significant increase is here. So which means this one is supposed to be two plus, right? Two plus. Uh, for D, to be honest, there is no, you know, real significant increase. Maybe we can say it's here, right? Uh, four times, pretty much four times. So if this is the idea, it is also two plus. So I think we will choose in between B and D. So what is the difference of B and D if they have the same amount of charge? Can we figure out which one is larger or smaller in size? Feel free to share your ideas. Yeah, so I think we have enough reason to assume B and D are in the same period, and then B is in the left side. Can we make this assumption? Because first, the three ionization energy are comparable, right? This pair, this pair, this pair. And then, as you know, uh, uh, Lot, you know, mentioned uh, B, has a smaller first ionization energy, so I will assume B is in the left side with you know less protons, and then D is in the right side with more protons. A higher proton number will increase the attraction, which will increase the ionization energy. So if this is the idea, if they both you know make two plus, although it really doesn't make so much sense, maybe maybe a more reasonable idea is they are in the in the same group. If they are in the same group. I will say D will be here. Yeah, because I think this makes more sense because they have the same charge, right? 
if they are in the same period, it's very less likely for them to have the same charge. So if this is the case, so obviously D is smaller in size, and then a smaller size, which means the larger lattice energy. Let me double check. If this is the case, if they are in the same period, first we cannot really you know, explain why they have the same charge. Secondly, will this kind of assumption also give us the same conclusion? So if this is the way, B2 plus and D2 plus, which one will have a smaller size? It's still the D2 plus, right? Because it has more protons. So we still get the same results. So D has a smaller size, which means it will have a higher lattice energy. So I tend to choose D. How do you guys think? What is the correct answer? It's D. Okay. This is my analysis. Uh, and I prefer they are in the same group. But you know, since those values are not fabricated, so we definitely can confirm, you know from the, the internet by checking those data, right? Uh, but when you are taking the test, obviously you do not have the access, so you, you still need to do some analysis. But at least it's relatively easy for you to eliminate A and C, but you may need to you know, think about the relationship between B and D. If you guys have time, you know, feel free to check the data and let me know what are the two elements. I assume they are in the same group rather than you know in the same period. Okay, uh, this is 44. Uh, and then the next one is in category 9, molecular structure and bonding. Oh, not so many questions actually. Uh, the next category is organic. So we will start from 56. Hmm, this is a pretty interesting question. Which one is the shortest? First, uh, they are all carbon-carbon bonds, but some of them are double bonds, some of them are single bonds. Some of them are very special. The bond order is 1.5. Do you know what I'm talking about? Think about the benzene ring. This is a very typical example for resonance, right? So the bond order of each carbon-carbon bond here should be 1 plus 2 over 2, so it should be 1.5. This is also a very typical observation in organic chem. So the, in the bending ring, the bond length or the bond strength is something in between a typical carbon-carbon double bond and carbon-carbon single bond. So I think compared to D, which is a pure double bond, we can eliminate A and B. A and B are supposed to be very similar to each other. So the higher the bond order, the shorter the bond, right? And C is a regular single bond. So C is supposed to be the longest. This one is supposed to be the shortest. These two are supposed to be in the middle. Does this make sense to you? I hope I, I touch you know, the questions you originally had. Okay. Uh, if I didn't, let me know. But I think the key point is here. Keep this in mind. Uh, next, we can have a look at question 59. Oh, OK. OK. Uh, first, you need to know some number nature in organic chem. Uh, you may need to know what is acetyl chloride, what is diethylamine, what is the NN diethyl acet acetamide, right? So, and then we need to convert this into the chemistry language by show the structure. So, the acetyl chloride is something like this. So, this is a type of organic molecules. So a CO double bond connect to a chlorine is called acetyl 
chloride. And then it reacts with the diethylamine. So amine is something with the nitrogen. Uh, it can be something like this. It can be something like this. So the R and the R prime means they, are, they can be different. It can also be something like this. So they are called primary amine, secondary amine, and tertiary amine. But they are all amines. So here is a diethyl amine, which means you will have two acid groups. So I use the line angle expression here, so which means this is the carbon, this is the carbon, this is the carbon, this is the carbon. And I ignore all of the hydrogens, okay? I didn't show the hydrogens. You guys need to figure out how many hydrogens on each carbon. And then the product is, is still estamide, so it's something like this. This is called N and diethyl. So the two acid groups are connected to the nitrogen. So this is why it's called N and diethyl acetamide. So this function group, the CO double bond with the nitrogen connected is called amide. It's called amide. You probably you know connect this with the peptide bonds in proteins, right? That is also a type of amide. So, what the question asking about? Oh, why is it less than 50% of the yield? Obviously, we are not so sure, right? But I think you can write down another byproduct, which is HCl, because this is a kind of substitution. The substitution reaction in organic chem is like the Double displacement in inorganic chem. So basically, it's A, B react with C, D, and they change friends, they change partner, and produce B and C. Right. So this is quite similar. So if you break down the bonds here, you break down the bond here. So the Cl bind with H to produce the byproduct HCl, and then the other two parts connect to each other. So this is called substitution in organic chem. So the reason why the yield is lower than 50 is because the HCl is a strong acid. It, need, it will neutralize the base, which is the reactants here. You guys all know the amine is a base, right? Because all of the amines have similar properties with ammonia. Because amines are just you know one or more hydrogens in the ammonia, is or are replaced by an organic group, a R group, right? So it still keep the lone pair on the nitrogen, and the lone pair on the nitrogen is the key point of the chemical properties of amines because it can accept a proton. So this is why these two will react with each other to produce A salt. This is quite similar to ammonium chloride, right? It's exactly the same pattern. A base neutralizes an acid. So obviously, if you have one, 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 one mole, and then the the HCl the byproducts will neutralize part of the reactants, which will decrease the percent yield, right? Because after it is protonated, the amine loses the ability to react with the acetyl chloride. Uh, if you further analyze the mechanism of this reaction, you probably re realize f in order to make this reaction happen, you also need to use this lone pair on the nitrogen. But now, after it is protonated, the lone pair is gone, so it loses the ability to keep the reaction. So this is why it's less than 50%, because the theoretical, the highest yield it can be is 50%. But typically, an organic reaction cannot you know, fully complete it. So this is why it's lower than 50%, at least no more than 50%. So I think uh, 
A is the correct answer. So I am analyzing this question based on we already know the story behind it. But if you don't know what is the story behind this, that is something you will really need to you know train your skills, right? Methods of elimination. You know, eliminate the most you know unreasonable answers, right? Uh, I don't know which one can you you know eliminate first. Which one doesn't make any sense here? I will say this one doesn't make any sense because it's a trace amount of water. So how can it you know converge at least half of the acetyl chloride, right? So I will eliminate C. Um, hydrogen bond and second order it doesn't make any sense because second order is related to kinetics, but here is about percent yield. Right? So one is related to equilibrium, another one is related to how fast the reaction is. So they are not related. Uh, the last one is a strong base but a weak nucleophile. So probably students will choose in between A and D because I think only these two make some sense. Right? And then that is something you need to further analyze. But if you do not know the reaction mechanism, it's still not very easy for you to pick up the correct, the most reasonable answer. But I don't know, this is also a sometimes related to your feeling. I, I, I knew some students who do not really fully understand the, the, the question, but they can always pick up the correct answer. So hopefully you have this kind of you know feeling. <laughs> okay, the next one is number 60. Uh, which is the last one? Oh, uh, biochem is something you know, really no student really likes. <laughs> biochem, because every year is is a very, it's always a very weird question for most of the years. Um, it asking which nitrogen in Guangyuan is most prone to alkylation. Alkylation means you know you have a R group and the R group is going to bind with the nitrogen and make the nitrogen to carry a positive charge. So basically the R group is previously positive and then you have the nitrogen and nitrogen will attack the R group and make a bond in between the nitrogen and the carbon in the R. So I would still you know prefer the methods of elimination. I don't know. I would pick choose C. Is C the correct answer? Okay. So now you know. Based on <laughs> if I confirm the answer, I can talk about my analysis. Uh, this is something very organic because all of those four nitrogens has a lone pair but not all of the lone pairs are easier to donate because you need to analyze the hybridization of each nitrogen and then try to think about is this lone pair on the nitrogen in a delocalized system or not. So let's start from which one? Maybe we can start from this one. Uh, I will start from if we analyze the hybridization. Do you guys all know hybridization? SP1, SP2, SP3? Let me know if you are not very sure. Because that it will be a, a long story. Because you know, even talking about the hybridization needs at least 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, let, let's you know, uh, start an analysis based on the assumption you all know the hybridization. Okay, if you don't know, uh, I will recommend you some resources for you to you know further read. Okay, so if we analyze the geometry of this nitrogen based on VS EPR, what's your conclusion, guys?
How many electron domains around this nitrogen? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. There are three bonding pairs, right? And one lone pair. So there are four in total, right? So if it's four, the electron domain configuration or geometry is tetrahedral. Does this make sense to you? But when we analyze the geometry of the molecule, we do not consider the lone pair. So it's the molecular geometry is called trigonal pyramidal, right? But this is not the correct answer here because this nitrogen has to be trigonal planar in order to delocalize with this ring. Let me give you a brief idea. So now say you have an annealing which is made by a benzene ring connected to an amine group. So if we analyze the geometry of this nitrogen based on VSEPR, we'll get the same conclusion. It's supposed to be trigonal pyramidal. But the, the real situation is this one has to be trigonal planar. So why? Because each carbon here is trigonal planar. So which means each carbon will have a unhybridized p orbital which is perpendicular to the benzene ring or the benzene plane and then if this nitrogen can also do a similar way change into trigonal planar something magic will happen what is the magic stuff right now you will have seven orbitals which are parallel to each other and then we call this kind of parallel relationship into delocalization. What is the meaning of delocalization? Localization means the electrons are kind of, you know, limited in between the two adjacent atoms, just like a regular covalent bond. So delocalization is the opposite, which means the electrons are kind of spread in a larger system. So in this way, this lone pair will be partially spreaded to the whole you know, benzene system, which will decrease the electron density of the lone pair. Does this make sense to you? Because the nitrogen has two electrons, but the six carbons has only six electrons in total. So if you compare the electron density, this is six over six, this is two over one. So obviously, the nitrogen has a much higher electron density than the carbon system. So after it is delocalized, the electron density here is spread, which means the electron density on this lone pair will be much lower compared to a regular amine group with a lone pair. If this lone pair is kind of you know uh, alone or separated without this kind of you know delocalized delocalization system. So if you guys have no question about this, now we can go back to have a look at the original structure. We can get to the conclusion. So as you can see, all of those three nitrogens they are either on the delocalized system or directly connected to the delocalized system. So this is why they are all trigonal planar, but the lone pairs has a much lower electron density compared to a regular nitrogen. But why this one is special? Uh, I will analyze this nitrogen in a different place. You know, keep this in mind, okay? So there is a CN double bond in a five-member ring. Something like this. So we are trying to focus on this nitrogen. So this nitrogen is also trigonal planar, but 
the way it shows the trigonal planner is different. So right now, one single electron here, two electrons here, one single electron here, one single electron here. So as you know, the overlap here make a pi bond, right? A pi bond, which is this one. And here is a sigma bond. This is something, you know, we are not going to discuss here. So very interesting. The lone point actually is towards out, which is not part of the delocalized system. So this is different from this lone pair. This lone pair is on the delocalized system. This one is perpendicular to the delocalized system. So this is why it has the regular property as a regular amine, uh, NH2. Does this make sense to you guys? Yeah, organic can is not easy because, you know, you need to read pretty much a whole book to just answer six questions. And even in college, organic chemistry is supposed to be the most challenging course um, for the student who major in chemistry. So, yeah, no worry. If you, you know, think this is hard, it's completely fine. Everyone thinks it's hard. Me too. Right? It's not easy. Uh, okay, I think uh, I pretty much finish. you know, the most confusing question of the non-calculation part. So guys, let's have a five minutes of break. Uh, you guys can, you know, get some water, go to the restroom, stretch out a little bit. You know, it's not easy to sit down here for two hours, right? So uh, I will see you guys yeah, at 8.08, oh, okay, 8.08. Oh, so see you guys later. Take a break. Don't sit here, okay? Stand up, stretch up.